Long live the song. Shame about the artist. I've said for many years that I feel sorry for the younger generation who will not experience the joy of going to a record shop, thumbing through albums, picking an album, maybe listening to that album in the shop before handing over that hard-earned cash to buy the album and take it home. And of course, when you get it home, this is when the experience really starts because you put it on the platter, you put the needle on it, and for the next 30 to 40 minutes or so, you listen to the tracks that the artist has put on that side of the album. And then when you finish with it, you turn it over. Unless, of course, you've got one of those fancy album record players that plays both sides at the same time. Um, and listen to the other side. Well, that's what I did in my teens and into my 20s, to be honest. Although, admittedly, by the time I got to my 20s, I was probably buying more CDs um, than album than vinyl-based albums. I still bought the odd vinyl-based album because you can't get some of the back catalogue, or you couldn't at that point get some of the back catalogue stuff on CD. Um, but I was still buying lots of vinyl 12-inch records because I was DJ. Um, and for some unknown reason, in a moment of madness, I sold my entire record collection many years back. However, we now look at how do we now consume music. Well, we stream it. We stream a song from one artist, and then we stream a song from another artist, and another, and another, and another. The younger generation rarely consumes an album's worth of material from an artist. Why am I restricting this to the younger generation? Well, because it mainly starts with them. The older generation will still listen, tend to listen to an album. But even the older generation are now starting to construct, consume single songs, construct playlists from those songs, and play little regard to the artist as a whole they just listen to the song. I've mentioned before that I listen to Messrs David Holloway and Paul Bindig, otherwise known as the Keyboard Chronicles, um, a podcast that I listen to quite frequently on my daily walks, although I haven't been walking much lately because I'm not feeling that well. Um, and on their latest podcast, they were talking about the phenomenon that's been caused by uh, Stranger Things playing Kate Bush's Running Up That Hill in uh, one of the episodes, or several of the episodes. I haven't watched Stranger Things, by the way, so I, had, I don't know how many episodes it's in, but I do know it's played in Stranger Things. Um, and the result of this is that all of a sudden, Running that up that hill, a song by Kate Bish, which was 1984, maybe five, was hitting the top of the, the UK charts. And I think it hit uh, high positions in a number of charts around the world. But in the UK, it was the number one spot. The guests on the podcast were recanting the story of the fact that they took their children out and their children were very into this uh, running up the hill track by Kate Bush. So he thought he'd educate them into some other tracks by Kate Bush. Now, those of you who are a certain age like me can remember Wuthering Heights and Babushka. Um, but what he thought he would do is he would play some other album tracks to his children when they were in the car asking for Stranger Things. It was an interesting experiment because what happened was the children said, oh yeah, can we listen to something else now, please, Dad? Remember, like, comment, subscribe to the channel. Go over to Instagram and follow me there. Go over to Facebook, follow me there. That's where the normal notices are. And consider becoming a Patreon. But what does this mean? This recanting 
by the guests on the podcast illustrates to me the streaming generation are not interested in the artist and finding more about the artist's previous work. They move from one song to the next, adding them to their playlists as they go. The technology has meant that you and I have a recording studio in our bedrooms and with the right skills you can take a song from recording to produce it and master it and then release it on one of the music portals without having to go through the whole middlemen which we regard as the music industry. And artists in recent years have done exactly that. If you perform a Google search and ask it how many tracks are uploaded to Spotify daily. It will tell you that the average number of tracks uploaded to Spotify daily is 60,000 worldwide. A quick bit of maths tells you that's a roughly 14 million songs uploaded to Spotify every single year. This is complete saturation. There is no way you can move through a Spotify listing to find new music on that scale of upload. As an artist, how do you stand out from the crowd? How do you get your music to the point where it's being streamed enough to make you an income? And let's be honest, most artists will tell you that you do not get paid handsomely for being streamed on Spotify. And not unless you're a Madonna or a U2 or an Arctic Monkeys or a, um, a Rolling Stones. The days of the named artist, I think, are over. Being U2 or being the Stones has come and gone. But if you can get a track picked up by a show or on social media, and it goes viral, then the platforms promote it for you. But if you're not established, then you're in the pool with everybody else, scrabbling to get your song above the parapet. Does this also mean the album is dead? Will artists just produce tracks as opposed to curating an album? You can take different views on this, this thought. One view is that rather than writing and recording and releasing an album of material, artists will just record and release material as it's ready, i.e. more frequently. However, recording music is a time-consuming process, which is why typically after an album, an artist will record it, release it, tour it, and then take a year off and maybe not write anything for another year. Hence the reason why you have periods of time between albums by, art, by established artists. Is this a good thing or is this a bad thing? It can be a very tiring exercise for an artist to release an album. This is, this is very true. If you listen to interviews with the likes of Genesis, Phil Collins, um, which I've been listening to recently, they will tell you that they don't want to go and start an album because the starting of an album would mean they're going to spend a year writing and recording it. Then they're going to spend a year on the road with it. And then they're going to spend more time promoting it. So by the time that album has finished, they've consumed about three years of their lives. And sometimes they're just not willing to put in that time commitment. So maybe recording single tracks is the way to go. And when you've got enough tracks, you just bundle the whole lot up and put it in an album. But then by that time, you already released it and there's no incentive for anybody to go and listen to the album. My view is that an album used to be a collation of songs around a theme. How was the artist feeling at that point in time? What sort of genre were they trying to write music for? It was collated it was produced and it was released. And the collation would have been around that theme and the production would also have been around that theme. So if it had a Latin vibe to it, you would have got much more um, 
Latin conga uh, and that sort of funky Latin beat. If it was a dance track, you might have got much more uh, heavy 909, 808, whatever it happens to be, percussion on the track. Individual releases are not collated in the same way. They stand alone as individual pieces of work. Which may be why the song rolls and the artist just fades into the background. In 20 years time, will we remember the artist's name who produced a certain song? If you were to ask me about songs by uh, Jean-Michel Jarre and Phil Collins and Genesis and, and bands that I know, if I heard that song on the radio, I'd be instantly able to go, that's a so-and-so, that's a so-and-so. And my housemates comment on the fact that when we're listening to the radio and they go, who's that? And I'll instantly go, oh, that's so-and-so, but their other track was better. I couldn't do that with the modern regime of releasing single songs because half the time, like most of the other jet population, the artist who released the song has come and gone. And on that note, I'm going to leave you and say, live long and prosper. Bye-bye.